Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Bird Foundation webinar that ensures feathered friends the Christmas bird count in grassland birds with Bruce Schrute and Vernon Ellsbury. My name is Erica Van Rinken. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. I'd also like to introduce you to Haley Howard, MPF's new Outreach and Education Coordinator, who's waving there, and um, she will be introducing future webinars. Uh, during today's presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to Bruce and Vernon. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Bruce Schrute retired from working 36 years as a park naturalist at Quiver River State Park, where he was involved in natural resource management, natural resource inventory, working with researchers and nature education. He has served on the MPF board since January 2000, served as secretary 2005 to 2012, and as vice president of science and management and chairman of the science and management committee. He has a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from the University of Missouri Columbia. Vernon Ellsbury is a graduate of Central Missouri State University, now the University of Central Missouri, with a degree in biology. He spent four years in the United States Air Force as an air traffic controller, 11 years teaching biology in West Central Missouri, 26 years appraising real estate in West Central Missouri, and has been retired since 2014. He is a past president of Citizens for Environmental Action, a local environmental group involved in a variety of environmental issues, one of which is managing a seven acre created prairie tract established in 1997 by Warnsburg's Parks and Recreation Department. Vernon is an avid birder, fisherman, word worker, husband, father, and grandfather. And now I will turn it over to Bruce and Vernon. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and today we'll be talking about Christmas bird counts. And even people that are not uh, serious birders have probably heard of Christmas bird counts. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. We'll talk a little bit about the counts and how they're done, and then go through some photos that I had of some of the birds or a number of the birds that um, you could possibly see on uh, the Christmas bird counts. So um, with that, Christmas bird counts uh, originated back in 1900. Um, at that time, or up until that time, there was kind of a tradition in many areas to do what were called side hunts. And people would go out maybe challenging other people of who could shoot the biggest pile of uh, feathered and furred animals. And so uh, Frank Chapman in 1900 with the uh, kind of fledgling National Audubon Society uh, decided that maybe he could organize a bird census instead of these bird hunts. So he is the one that uh, kind of originated our uh, Christmas bird counts. So in 1900, um, he got 27 uh, people and they established 25 counts across, uh, across North America. And so 25 counts, uh, 27 counters, and they got 90 species. Now, if we fast forward to just a couple of years ago, um, this endeavor has grown. And so now there's over 2,600 Christmas bird counts basically just in the Western Hemisphere, over 1,990 Christmas bird counts just in the U.S. Uh, overall, over 81,000 counters, including over 62,000 people just in the U.S. have take, took part in Christmas bird counts that year. Altogether, um, they recorded 672 species and 39 million birds. Although unfortunately, this number of 39 million birds was actually 6 million less birds than the previous year. Maybe indicating some of what you've been hearing in recent years about, uh, about our loss of, of birds. In Missouri uh, last year, we had 30 Christmas bird counts. Over 430 people took part counted 152 species and a little over a million and a half birds right here in Missouri. So uh, how are these Christmas bird counts done? Well, there's a number of parameters 
And first of all, Christmas bird counts are always done within the period between December 14th and January 5th. So this is the Christmas bird count period. And an individual Christmas bird count is done one day in that period of time. These are only on areas that are established and approved by the National Audubon Society. So it's not just anywhere. These are established approved uh, bird count areas. Each one consists of a circle and the circles are 15 miles in diameter. So a seven and a half mile radius a uh, circle is drawn around a given point, and this determines the count area. Within that area, on the day of the Christmas bird count, counters count all the birds that they can act accurately uh, identify. So sight, sound, if that uh, works out okay, and um, if you can accurately identify it, it gets counted. And then all the results are submitted to the compiler. So in a Christmas bird count, every circle has a compiler and the compiler uh, is the one that um, organizes who's counting where and submits the results. So what do you count on Christmas bird count days? You count every individual bird that you can identify. You count uh, individuals by species. And then you also record how much time you spent hours walking and driving. This is very important because this is a way to kind of compare different counts and counts over the years is by uh, the amount of time uh, groups were counting. And then you also record the miles that you walked and drove to take part in it. Now, there is another um, kind of citizen science bird project that sometimes might get confused. It's called eBirds. And eBirds is through the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And it's a great way to count birds and keep track of what you see, but it is different from the Christmas bird count. With eBirds, you can just go any place you want. You uh, can identify places that you go birding, you pick the spot, you can go any time of the year you want. You record your start time. Again, you record your duration, how many hours um, you were counting, uh, the distance you drove. You get um, uh, a list of what you saw. You can upload pictures. And so Chris, and so eBirds can be done anytime. Um, also through eBirds, there is uh, what's called the great yard, great backyard bird count. And this again is just done through eBirds, um, but it's a, again, kind of a special designation for people to go out and count. And this is done in February from between the 17th and 20th of February. So this is, um, so that will be next year's backyard bird count on that weekend. So uh, real quickly to kind of uh, compare with Christmas bird counts, you only count in a designated circle compared to eBirds where you just count anywhere. You, in Christmas bird counts, you only count on designated count days, eBirds, anytime. With Christmas bird counts, um, the count is organized by a compiler. And with eBirds, you just do whatever you want. And then on Christmas bird counts, the results go to the compiler and that person is the one that submits them, uh, where on eBirds, you just fill it out online uh, yourself anytime. And then Christmas bird counts are a project of the National Audubon Society and eBirds are with the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. So here in Missouri, as I mentioned, um, in the last year or two, there's been uh, 30 designated or approved Christmas bird counts. This is where they're located in the state. And so you might think, well, why is, why is it uh, something I wanna do? Come out on um, a cold winter day to, to look for birds? Uh, what's this all about? Why should I do it? Well, it's a great way to learn about birds being out in the field, oftentimes with people that are very experienced uh, counters and, and know their birds very well. So it's a great way to learn about birds. It can be fun. It can be challenging to try and 
and see how many you can see um, on a given day. It's a great way to meet nice people that have similar interests that also enjoy getting out and, and uh, looking at birds. It's a really nice way to enjoy the outdoors during the winter. If the weather isn't too bad, there are some days uh, during the winter uh, where it, it can be a bit nasty, but that's part of it too, because Christmas bird counts are held on that designated day, no matter what the weather is. And um, if it's if there's a matter of safety, counts can be canceled or postponed, but otherwise, if it's not uh, too icy or snowy and there's not a safety issue, the count goes on. Uh, Christmas bird counts are a way that you can contribute to conservation. Uh, it's a way to show uh, local and global population trends in our birds. Um, it's a way for showing their distribution, how it may change over time, and it's a way of documenting what birds are found in what locations, what park or conservation area or wildlife refuge um, has these birds. It's also a way to contribute to science. There's been over 300 peer-reviewed journal articles using data from the Christmas bird counts. Uh, it's being used to show things like the effects of climate change and the loss of biodiversity. And one of the most important things is that they have been going on so long. Uh, just a very large, long running data set of where the birds are. And so this is a, a great importance to science because of the longevity of it and the ability to be able to compare to past years. Now, when you're doing a Christmas bird count, you're not gonna see all the birds that are around. Of course, many of our uh, well-known birds, including many of our uh, very well-known and well-liked grassland birds like scissor tail flycatchers, Dick Sissels, Henslow Sparrows, these birds are gone for the winter. They're, they breed here. And so there are our birds here part of the year, but uh, these are also ones that migrate south for the winter. So on the Christmas bird count, we're only going to pick up the birds that are able to tolerate our Missouri winters, the cold, the snow, um, whatever it might hold. These are the birds that you can find around here this time of year. So with that, uh, I'm gonna run through a, a list of some of the birds that you might be encountering on Christmas bird counts. And especially if you have a chance to um, uh, take part in any of them and are out and getting, and are interested in getting out and doing any of our MPF areas or other grassland areas, some of the more notable uh, sort of grassland birds you can expect to find around this time of year would include ones like the Northern Harrier, a uh, uh, hawk that is uh, very prominent out on our grasslands now. Uh, harriers are a very interesting hawk that just kind of glides and floats, oftentimes very low over grasslands, not really soaring that much way overhead, but glides very low hunting over the, the grassland areas. Uh, kind of unique for a uh, hawk in many respects and easy to identify because of the white patch white stripe it has across the rump. Now, females are typically brown, like I believe immature birds. Uh, adult males are more of this gray, and I think sometimes called gray ghosts. But in each case, they have this white strip across the rump that is um, uh, for sure identification when you see that. Another hawk that you can tip more typically find in grassland areas during the winter is the rough-legged hawk. Uh, similar to a red-tailed hawk in build, but uh, with a different colors, different color patterns, uh, the dark belly, and most notably when they're flying, you can see this kind of dark wrist patch. And this dark wrist patch here is very distinctive for the rough-legged hawk. Short-eared owls are another classic winter grassland bird. Uh, again, uh, kind of unique for owls. They, um, again, will sort of glide over the, 
the grasslands. They've got extremely long wings and sometimes it almost looks like they're floating like a butterfly or a moth. Um, they also are known for being crepuscular, which means they're mostly active at uh, sort of twilight and at dawn. So um, sometimes you'll actually see one out during the day, but that's unusual. But as it gets close to, to uh, twilight, to sunset, uh, that's when they come out and primarily do their hunting. There are birds like our northern bobwhite. Um, this is a, a very classic grassland bird, one that there's a lot of conservation interest in now. It's our only native quail. Um, and so they are typical grassland birds and could show up in uh, Christmas bird counts. There's also a woodpecker, almost kind of the unwoodpecker of the woodpeckers, the common flicker. Um, looks pretty typical for a woodpecker, but it spends a lot of its time down on the ground. So you're probably more likely to actually flush one flying up from the ground where it's hunting ants and other insects than um, actually seeing one up in a tree, even though they do use trees, uh, but uh, they're very oftentimes on the ground and that's probably where you see them the most. There are meadowlarks, and meadowlarks are pretty easy grassland birds to identify with the bright yellow underside, the sort of black V across the throat. Um, so meadowlarks are, are pretty easy to identify. Uh, also, as they go flying away, they have white feathers on the edge of their tail. So uh, that gives them a distinctive look when they're, when they're flying off. However, we do have two kinds of meadowlarks in Missouri, eastern and western. The eastern is far more common, but, um, but there are western meadowlarks scattered pretty much all across the state. So to be able to identify them, if they are calling, their calls are quite distinct. And uh, they do call occasionally during the winter. So if you do get to hear them, that would be the most for sure way, the easiest way to tell them apart. If not, then it involves getting a real close look. And for example, on the eastern meadow lark, going right back from the lower part of its bill um, is primarily just a, like a whitish strip. Where on the western meadow lark, that area coming back from the base of the bill is yellow. So um, it can be quite challenging to identify them if they're not calling. If they do call, then you can, can say what it is pretty easy. If you can't and you don't get close enough to be able to see that and can't really tell them for sure, then typically on a Christmas bird count report, you would just put down meadowlark species, meaning you know it's a meadowlark even if you can't be sure of which one of the two it is. We, all, <clears throat> we also have two kinds of shrikes in Missouri uh, that show up during the winter. <clears throat> The loggerhead shrike is around here year round. Um, a very interesting bird, uh, sometimes referred to as a butcher bird because they do actually catch smaller animals to eat their predators and um, have this kind of distinctive hooked bill. Um, they also have a black face mask. The loggerhead shrike is pretty much gone from Eastern Missouri now, but they're still found in Western Missouri. And like I say, they're found here year round. The northern shrike can show up about anywhere, but it's only here during the winter and is not very common, but it, it does show up during the winter scattered around. The beak on the northern shrike is much bigger than on the loggerhead shrike. The black mask is a little bit thinner and the kind of the eye is not totally included. It kind of, you can kind of see where the black has to go around the eye. And then if you get a good look, the Northern Shrike has kind of a scaly look on the breast. So very similar, but if you do get a good look, uh, you can tell the two Shrikes apart. Both of them are really good finds. And then during the winter, we have a lot of sparrows. Sparrows, of course, are kind of small brown birds, but um, with a little practice, you can tell uh, most of them pretty readily. Um, the white-throated sparrow here has some kind of white and black, or sometimes it's just light and dark brown striping on the head. 
Um, they will oftentimes have the little bit of yellow right here above the eye. So that's really distinctive if they have that. But definitely they have this very white throat patch, hence the name. So this is the white throated sparrow. The white crown sparrow has black and white striping on the head, but it's much more distinctive striping on the head. They don't have the white throat. They also have a pinkish colored bill. Now the Harris's sparrow is more of a Western Missouri bird, uh, not found too much on the Eastern side of the state, but in, in Western Christmas bird counts, uh, they'll show up. The adults with this black face are unmistakable. Um, that's really distinctive. If it's an immature bird, it won't have the black face, but it will have kind of a black necklace, uh, kind of black markings, um, like coming down from right below the throat. It also has kind of a pinkish colored bill. There's a swamp sparrow, real common sparrow. Um, no really bright distinctive markings, except the wings here have a distinct sort of uh, reddish or rufous color to them. No place else, but just the patch on the wing here has this distinctly more reddish brown uh, look to it. There's a savanna sparrow, one that is uh, has a very streaked breast, and they don't always show it, but most of the time they have a little bit of yellow above the eye, the stripe above the eye. Uh, sometimes it's not this bright, but uh, they do typically have a little bit of a yellow tinge on the stripe above the eye. There's the American tree sparrow. Um, and American tree sparrows, this kind of bright reddish brown cap striped through the eye, uh, just kind of the sort of black and yellow colored bill. And then uh, usually you can see a little bit of a blackish spot on the chest, not striped, but just this one single spot. Then there's a field sparrow, which looks very similar to a tree sparrow, kind of a reddish cap, a little bit of brown through the eye, but it's got a pink bill, distinctly pink bill, and no spot on the chest. Song sparrows have a distinctive spot on the chest. They've got a striped underside, and it comes to a very pronounced spot right in the middle. Lincoln sparrows uh, can be pretty similar, but usually not a real distinctive spot. And you can see a little kind of strip of a uh, kind of tan or tawny color going across the upper chest. Fox sparrows have a striped underside, but this distinctly bright reddish brown uh, markings on the tail, the wings, the underside, and that. Also, they are bigger than any of the other sparrows. So size can sometimes help you out. There's a Lacan sparrow. This is a fairly rarely seen one, but uh, it's got a more distinctive yellow stripe above the eye and a little bit even below. It doesn't have that definite streak breast like the savanna sparrow does, uh, but Lacan sparrows are pretty uncommon, but they do show up. And then we come to the dark eyed junco, which people are familiar with, uh, the kind of dark gray head and back bright white underside, pinkish colored bill. And again, when they go flying away, the outer tail feathers are white and very distinctive. We also sometimes in just more open areas, not necessarily grasslands, but more open areas, we'll find ones like the Slapland Longspur. It's only here during the winter. Their uh, summer colors are just tremendous. But when we see them here during the winter, these are their typical winter colors. Uh, and it seems to kind of have this sort of dark crescent shape marking uh, on the, or right behind the eye. And then also really liking open areas, even crop fields, and that is the horn lark. Um, a really interesting, interesting looking bird. It's got a bit of this uh, mask on it, uh, kind of a colorful head. And when you see it really well, you'll even see a few of these little feathers kind of sticking up on top 
that give it the horned look. A uh, hawk that likes open areas is our common red-tailed hawk um, all over the state. The tail isn't always this bright red, but uh, at least it's unmarked compared to another similar hawk, which actually likes more wooded areas, the red-shouldered hawk. But you can see on the red-shouldered hawk, the breast is kind of this reddish tan. Uh, it's kind of barred going across. And when it's flying very distinctively, you can see the tail is striped instead of solid color like on the red-tailed hawk and even these little kind of windows in the wing. We do get increasingly turkey vultures. They used to be only in real southern Missouri, but now they're showing up uh, uh, much farther to the north. Um, so the turkey vultures are our most common vulture here in Missouri, but we do have increasing numbers of black vultures, um, especially again in the south, but again, they're moving up too. They've got a much shorter tail proportionate tail than a turkey vulture has, and they have these kind of white spots on the end of their wings, not just the light shining through the feathers, but actually kind of whitish spots on the outside of their wings. There's the little American kestrel, actually a small falcon, uh, pretty brightly colored and with these very noticeable uh, kind of vertical black, stri black stripes on its face. A rare visitor to Missouri, but they do occasionally show up on Christmas bird counts, is a snowy owl. Uh, it's, of course, an owl from, for, from the far north that uh, just comes down here uh, during the winter, some years much more than, than other years. Doves, the morning dove is our only native, um, is our co most common native dove or pigeon. Uh, that we have. White winged doves would be pretty rare in Missouri. Uh, other than that, the morning dove is our only native uh, dove or pigeon. And we have, of course, red winged blackbirds. Uh, males are easy to identify, black with the red and yellow on the wing. Even when they're flying in a flock, you can see the red patches. Uh, females, though, are just kind of brown and uh, with a very streaked pattern. Oftentimes, though, you'll see males and females in mixed flocks, so you can at least pretty easily pick out the males. There's also common grackles, which are bigger than red-winged blackbirds. Um, they've got always this really kind of shiny iridescent uh, on their head, kind of this bluish and purplish iridescence. Their bill is much bigger than on a, a, like a red-winged blackbird, and the bird itself is quite a bit bigger, too. Brown-headed cowbirds do stick around here during the winter. Um, the males, again, pretty distinctive because of the brown head. You have to get in pretty good light to see it, but the brown head compared to the black body. Uh, their bill is also quite a bit heavier than the actual blackbirds. And rusty blackbirds are another blackbird that only is here during the winter. Uh, and when we see them during the winter, they uh, seem to have this kind of rusty looking black or kind of brownish colors uh, that are very distinctive on the rusty blackbird. We also have starlings. Now starlings are black in color, but they are not blackbirds. They're an entirely different group of birds with their short stubby tail and their yellow bill. Um, European starlings, of course, are not native as are birds like the house sparrow and house finch and rock pigeon, but we count these birds just the same. The American goldfinch, during the summer, they're the really bright yellow, uh, what some people call wild canaries. During the winter, they don't have the bright yellow, just kind of this pale yellow, but they do have the black wings and white wing bars that are very distinctive especially, not totally, but especially if there's water nearby. Uh, you might be fortunate to be able to count some bald eagles. Of course, these are, this one is adult, uh, whereas the immatures are just going to be kind of a blotchy brown, but the same big, heavy beak and, uh, and that that the adults have. And also around the water, you can find a number of other birds. I'm not gonna get into all the different kinds of waterfowl and most of the really um, 
aquatic birds, but uh, they are around. And of course, white pelicans are, are one example. Great blue herons are found around here too. And really they're the only heron or egret which is commonly seen in Missouri during the winter. Any others would be quite rarities, but great blue herons are seen pretty commonly uh, throughout the state. And again, not many shorebirds around here during the winter, but on Christmas bird counts, the ones that show up most regularly would be the Wilson snipe, uh, kind of a streak back, this extremely long bill, and then a the killdeer, very long-legged shorebird, although not only found around the water, they can be found in a lot of open areas. They also have this double black stripe on their chest. And belted kingfishers, even though they feed on fish, they can usually find enough open water so that they can catch fish and stick around here all winter long. Usually around streams or bottomland forests around uh, wetlands and that is usually the best place to find this winter wren. Um, very small little bird, probably best described as looking like a brown golf ball with a tail sticking up. And in open marshy areas, you can sometimes be fortunate and find a marsh wren, which has kind of a reddish color on top, but basically a whitish, more of a whitish uh, belly and a little bit of striping back here on the back. Now, as we move into more shrubby areas, uh, you can sometimes during the winter, if you're lucky, pick up a brown thrasher. Brown thrashers, um, are very notable, this kind of reddish brown color on their back, white wing bars, a streaked uh, underside, and a very long, thin bill. Another bird that likes really shrubby areas is the eastern towhee. Uh, towhees are um, very distinctive with the black head and back and tail, but the brownish on the side and the white underside. Females have the same kind of pattern, but uh, the head and the back will be just brown instead of the, the black of the males. We have turkeys that sometimes you might get fortunate and see. Uh, among the hawks that you can find in our wooded areas, uh, one is a Cooper's hawk, a smaller hawk, um, but it is very close related to another smaller hawk called a sharp-shinned hawk. The sharp-shinned hawk um, is mostly only here during the winter. So during the winter, we do have both of these. Cooper's hawks are bigger and they do have that more rounded tail. Sharp shins are smaller and with a more squared tail. But again, this can be difficult to tell depending on how you see the bird. So if you're not sure, you would put these down on the farm as an occipiter. An occipiter is a group that includes both those birds. So if you uh, are sure it's one of these, but you can't tell which, it would be listed as an occipiter. We have owls like barred owls with their nice round faces, great horned owls, even bigger and with the ear tufts. Woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers can even be on small shrubs, but they've got a very small little beak, not nearly as wide as the, not nearly as long as the width of their head. Hairy woodpeckers are a little bit bigger and their bill is about the length of the width of their head help you kind of distinguish those in the field. Red-bellied woodpeckers, even though they've got red on their head, they've also got the red on the belly. And red-headed woodpeckers, um, even if they don't have the red head, because sometimes juveniles, the head will just be blackish, but with that distinctive black and white coloration, you could easily see those flying through the woods. Pileated woodpeckers are by far our largest woodpeckers with the bright red crest. And there's the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Does have a little bit of a yellowish belly. Looks a little bit like a downy or a hairy woodpecker, but there is more red on the head, but they always have this big wide stripe on the wing. And that tells them for sure. Then we move into the songbirds like uh, our state birds, Eastern bluebirds, a really classic bird for savannas or right kind of at the edge of a grassland where you do have some scattered trees. American robins are around here. We see them summer and winter. So they oftentimes can be quite common, but uh, they are thrushes 
And one more, one of the other thrushes that uh, you don't see nearly as often, but they are around is a hermit thrush. It's got more of a spotted pattern. It's got kind of a, a robin build to it, but it's got a spotted pattern on the breast. The back is just mostly a, a brown, but towards the tail, it gets real reddish brown. So that reddish brown tail is distinctive. Then we have our real common birds uh, that are pretty much all over, blue, jay, blue jays, tufted titmice, white-breasted nuthatches, although only during the winter, but uh, sometimes you will see red-breasted nuthatches, not nearly as common, and they've got that black stripe through the side of their face, uh, but they are around at times. And then there's chickadees, Carolina and black cap chickadees, but you have to kind of watch because black cap chickadees will be in northern Missouri. Carolina chickadees, and I actually can't tell which one these are, Carolina chickadees will be in the very southern part of Missouri. You can't tell them apart just by looking at them. If you hear them call, black cap chickadees have a two note call, Carolina chickadees a four note call. So it's really easy to tell. I mean, I can even count up to four to know if it's a, a Carolina or a black cap chickadee if you hear them calling. If you don't hear them calling, uh, there's a line from about southwest Missouri up through about St. Louis. Much north of that is a black capped, much south of that is a Carolina. But if you're kind of along that zone through there, um, you can't really tell which one unless it's calling. And so then you just have to simply put down chickadee. Brown creepers a very tiny, well camouflaged little bird on tree trunks with the brown back and the white underside and this neat little curved bill. Uh, Carolina wrens, um, which oftentimes can be heard even during the winter, they've got this beautiful energetic call that, that they give out, uh, which really sounds great on a winter's day. Um, they classic wren with the white stripe above the eye and You'll see these in the woods, not out in open marshes like the marsh wren, but uh, you can also tell on this Carolina wren that underside is that uh, really uh, buffy color that it has. We have two kinds of little kinglets, golden crown kinglets with black and white striping on their head and this very distinctive bright yellow, golden yellow stripe right on top of his head. But they've got a cousin called the ruby crown kinglet that's much more nondescript, but it does have a, a partial eye ring, the white around the eye. It's got wing bars and kind of yellow edging on the wings. And these are very tiny little birds. Cedar wax wings, very distinctive. They're really slink looking, sleek looking brown birds, um, kind of reminds you of a female cardinal with a crest, but they've got the black face mask. They have a very distinctive yellow tip on the tail. So when you see them flying, uh, you always see this yellow band just across the end of the tail. And if you get a good look, you might even see the little red kind of waxy tips on some of their wing feathers, which gives them the name waxwing. Mockingbirds, just kind of a solid gray bird, but with some white on the wing, and again, white on the outside edge of the tail. So very distinctive when they're flying. Purple finches, male and female. Another kind of finch that's uh, not seen nearly as often, but they are around is a pine siskin, uh, a streaked little finch. Again, some of the, the lining, colorful lining on their wing feathers and a small, very conical, very sharp pointed bill. The only warbler that you can regularly find in Missouri during the winter is this one, the yellow rumped warbler. Uh, they do have yellow patches on their shoulders, but they also have the very distinctive yellow patch on their rump, which is why sometimes people call them butterbutts. And of course, the Northern Cardinal male and female that are common here in uh, um, many natural habitats, as well as being found uh, commonly around feeders and around homes. So this is just a sampling of some of the birds that you can expect to find on our Christmas bird counts. And it just so happened that several uh, 
established Christmas bird count circles do include Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies. And so four of them to be exact. And so um, one of the things, if you are interested in taking part in a Christmas bird count, you need to contact the compiler. You don't go out and just do it on your own. You contact the compiler who keeps track of where people are and what's being uh, covered in each of these particular circles. But we're very fortunate because one of our MPF board members, Vernon Ellsbury, uh, is a very avid birder. He has been doing Christmas <laughs> bird counts for many decades. He has been a compiler <laughs> of Christmas bird counts for many decades. And so Vernon will now give you a little bit of a, a take on what it's like to actually do one and will be uh, leading a group as part of the coal camp Christmas bird count um, on December 28th. So Vernon, do you want to take it away? I will do that. Um, well, now that you know all your birds, uh, I believe you're ready to do a Christmas bird count. Uh, I'm sure you've committed all those to memory. I'm a bit of a newbie uh, in the Missouri Prairie Foundation, just starting on my third year. But as Bruce mentioned, I'm not a newbie uh, as a Christmas bird counter. As a matter of fact, this will be my 51st consecutive year. And I, I've been interested in birds my entire life, but uh, really just got started about the time I started college. So uh, I was about, I think I was around 24 when I did my first count. And, a lot, and I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, I thought I might just mention a couple of things. Bruce mentioned that we have a, a fairly new acquired prairie, about a, we've had it a year or so, called Thoda Prairie, and it's in between Deepwater and Lowry City. And about 40 years ago, that was in my area and I was counting uh, the Montrose um, Christmas count. And I talked a hill uh, and there was a winter wheat field off to my right. And I counted 72 greater prairie chickens. Now, I don't imagine there's 72 greater prairie chickens left in the state, uh, but I hope there is. But uh, they're certainly starting to disappear. So I've seen a lot of changes um, in not just you know, the, the kinds of birds that you see and things are the numbers, but also in, in the techniques that we have. Uh, actually, uh, even as recently as the, the uh, 100th, this is 101st count, if you can see that. This is a, a American birds, Missouri Audubon, or the National Audubon Society puts, used to put it out in hard copy. There's 666 pages in this book and all, pretty much all that is, is just lists of birds that various counts uh, found. And they range from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, one raven. <laughs> That's usually what they get, uh, one or two ravens, all the way down into Texas and um, Florida and California, where they may get upwards of, a, uh, of nearly 200 anywhere. Usually there's... Uh, a few that break 200. So anyway, uh, I, I have plenty of experience and started out with binoculars and a field guide and off we would go. And we these circles that Bruce mentioned are divided up into areas depending on how many people that you have. And you try to cover that entire area and find every uh, bird that you possibly can. Uh, so there's some gonna be some problem with birds they tend to move you know around some and so some sometimes you may count the same bird a few times but you know for the most part I think I think our counts are fairly accurate but it really doesn't if you're thinking about becoming a um, a part of this program or this uh, counting thing this Christmas bird counting thing it, it really doesn't make any difference how old you are I have a friend that retired at 65 and started, and he hadn't ever done any birding in his life. And he started birding. He's a very avid and good, excellent birder now. And uh, uh, he, he actually does the coal camp count uh, and two or three others every year. There are people that try to do one every single day uh, of the count period. So you have your obsessive counters, which you know start on the 14th of December and they do their last one on the 5th. And they may go to very, fairly, you know, several states to get that done. Uh, 
so they drive all night. It's crazy, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, you will learn a lot. You begin to develop techniques just about as soon as you start. Uh, the little brown birds Bruce was talking about, and of course his beautiful pictures illustrate that they actually uh, aren't just a bunch of little brown birds. You'll be pleasantly surprised if you haven't done much birding to see some of the most beautiful things you've ever seen when you get some binoculars on them and get good light. Uh, you'll start to develop uh, techniques. They vary with people, you know, person to person. Uh, they'll tell you to start at the head when you see a bird and work your way down and try to see all these characteristics that Bruce was pointing out. And, uh, but you'll find that what you'll probably do before very long is you'll categorize them almost instantly uh, as to their size or, or where they're located or their behavior. It'll clue you in real quick as to what smaller group of birds you might have. And you can start from there then and start trying to figure out which, which one of those maybe 10 different birds um, that it is. And, you know, things have changed a lot. Uh, it's, I, I think, I guess I have to say it's easier to bird now than it used to be. Used to that field guide, you know, and your hands are freezing and you're trying to find the sparrows and, and uh, you're going a little crazy. But now with your phone, there's apps for everything. You, um, it's, uh, it's really, I think you can become a good birder pretty fast even have apps on the, on the calls. You can just hold your phone out there. It hears the bird, it'll tell you, you know, which bird it is. Um, I do think though, as an old man, <laughs> that's been doing it a long time, that maybe uh, you don't wanna depend on that entirely. Uh, I, think, I think it's better for you and it's more fun to try to figure some of these things out for your, on your own. Um, <clears throat> So let's go to the, uh, the uh, coal camp count. It's on, I would like to invite anyone on this program to, that would like to get started, maybe to start at the coal camp count, especially you MPF folks, if you wanna get into trying to find some grassland birds and see some of these prairies that maybe you haven't seen yet. Uh, there are several of them um, in this circle, uh, Friendly Prairie, uh, Lordy Marker Prairie, um, Drover's Prairie, uh, uh, and there's a, Bruce just put something up here where you can see those, uh, where the, the count, almost the very center of the count where the bird is in the yellow, uh, that the Lordy Marker Prairie is just uh, north of that point, and there's about 40, uh, 400 acres there, a little less than 100 of which is undisturbed prairie, uh, but it's a good area, and, and we'll get out and take a look at that. Uh, the compiler of this count is going to um, let some of the people that go with me and my group and let us have some of this prairie region. So if you'd like to get out and take a look at it, December 28th, uh, meet at the Classic Restaurant, which is on the east side of town on Highway 52. It's on the, it's on the uh, north side of the road and it's at, right towards the east side of town. It looked like it was an old drive-in, I think, at one time. We'll have breakfast there. He'll give us our areas and you get to meet everybody that's on the count and then we'll head out and one of the things that we do on these counts in order to get as many of the birds that are out there as possible is we divide um, uh, our time up <clears throat> with the various habitat types prairie being one that would be important that's for sure uh, we have lots of prairie in this general area there's privately owned prairie uh, MPF prairies, MDC prairies, and we really appreciate some of the people in that area that, um, you know, have privately owned prairies that have never been plowed, that are taking good care of them and hopefully always will. And um, Susan Lordy Marker and her husband, Dennis, um, uh, are largely responsible for Missouri Prairie Foundation's purchase of what we now call Lordy Marker Prairie, and we really appreciate that. Uh, they also own some prairie land of their own uh, in the general vicinity, and uh, they are uh, very good stewards. Uh, so anyway, when we get out there, we try to break up our time with different habitat types, with the prairie woodland riparian, which is along streams, uh, roadside, which is very important, ponds and lakes. We have to look for flyovers, so you have to keep your eye 
open all the time if you see a flock of snow geese going over or something like that. You may wonder how in the world do you count those snow geese? Well, you, you count as best you can. What I like to do is count about 50 of them and then try to figure out how many groups of 50 would be there and it gets you fairly close, I think. All you need is a pair of binoculars and some uh, courage to come out and get and help us out. Uh, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce and Vernon. That was wonderful. This is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And if anyone has any questions, um, you can type those into the Q&A section and I will relay them to uh, Bruce and Vernon. Um, there is one question of Cheryl asks, are there Mississippi kites in Adair County, Missouri? Um, oh. Where's Adair County, I guess will be my first question. Um, it's For where Kirksville. Kirksville is. Maybe oh. Bruce, are you familiar? Uh, I'm not sure. I know I'm in kind of northeast Missouri, a little bit north of St. Charles, or a little bit north of St. Louis, and we do have Mississippi kites in our area only during the summer. They're not here this time of year, so they won't show up in a Christmas bird count, but you will see them during during the summer. I can't say for sure if um, if they are seen if they are seen as far north as. Kirksville. Um, actually, you could probably check that on eBirds and get an idea, but I'm not sure offhand. Thank you. Um, there's a question about finding compiler information, uh, especially the MDC uh, areas close to Montrose, Lower City. Could you put the slide back up that had Vernon's information um, in terms of the high uh, for the area that so Vernon, again, can you can you explain um, maybe for there might be some folks who, who joined us a bit late um, the area that you compile for, and then if people um, if they want to find other compiler information, could you repeat where where someone would find that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the Knob Noster count is my granddaughter and I work on that. She's actually the compiler now. I handed that off. To her this year, we've been co-compilers for a good long time, but uh, our count is on the um, 18th of December, and uh, we we can still take new people on that. I've assigned the areas already, but there's probably room in cars. Now, the Montrose count, the, if you were asking about that, that's Rhonda Edmonds. Uh, she lives here in Warsburg, where I'm at, and she's the uh, compiler for that count. But as far as how to find the compilers, I think you just need to get on the Audubon Christmas Bird Count website, and I believe they have them all listed there. Thank you, Vernon. And, and um, we can send that information out, uh, the the websites that you have here, Vernon, in an email, along with a, re a link to a recording of, of this presentation to everybody who registered. There is a question about what time does the bird count on the 28th start? And I think you said you start with breakfast. In, a, in that Start, restaurant. Right, starts at, we meet there at seven. Um, uh, and you can have breakfast there at that little restaurant if you want. And he and the compiler, um, Ryan Steph, uh, Stephens is his name. And he'll, he'll assign the groups and give you a map and um, various things to take with you. And, uh, and then it's over at, at uh, dark and there's a compilation party I guess you could call it a local church there and they give you soup and chili and a dessert and we sit around and and everybody says what birds they found so you can see what all the other groups found it's kind of fun it takes about an hour very good that does sound fun and it certainly has been a treat to see all these beautiful photos of birds especially on a rather gray day that we're having here at least in um, mid-Missouri um, there's a question about that restaurant again that you mentioned where you meet for breakfast. Can you just repeat the location? And we could put that in the email that goes out as well. Okay, it's called the Classic Classic Restaurant. And it's on the east edge of uh, Coal Camp, right on Highway 52, which is the, the high, main highway that goes through the town from east to west. And it'll be on the north side of the road. And it reminds you of an old drive-in 
you know, uh, restaurant where you like a Sonic or something. I think it used to be a drive-in a long time ago. Uh, it's really the only restaurant in that general area, so you, you can't miss it. <laughs> Thank you, Vernon. But again, do you want folks to, to, to call you first? I think or it would be a good idea. And so I can give uh, the compiler a heads up on how many people might be coming in addition to who he's already expecting. Great. Yes, that's that sounds good. And um, I wanted to mention too, uh, you both or, or, or you mentioned about some some birds that um, I guess are more likely to be seen maybe than heard at this time of year. But the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has wonderful recordings of bird songs. Of course, you mentioned the apps as well, Vernon, and uh, we can add a link to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website in the email that goes out. Um, and uh, so if, if folks wanted to listen to some of the calls, um, Marge has just put in the chat that the classic is one mile east of the four way stop in downtown Colt Camp. So that that might yeah. help others. Um, I uh, don't see any other questions. Um, Bruce and Vernon, do you have anything else to add before we sign off? I believe I, I covered my part. <laughs> yeah, I might just quickly mention with these uh, websites, um, this is the National Audubon's website specifically for Christmas bird counts or the Audubon site in general. This is the eBirds where you go for that. Um, this all about birds is actually uh, through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and you can search for different kinds of birds and besides uh, a number of photos, but it also has their calls and that um, at all about birds. And then the Missouri Birding Society, uh, they do have uh, on their site uh, posted what uh, Christmas bird counts are going on and who I believe is the compiler for those just here in Missouri. Thank you, Bruce. I want also to invite everyone to tune in and register for another free webinar we will have on December 21st. It is called Restoring Home, The Journey Back to Native, and it features another uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation board member, Jan, uh, Jane Haslag, who um, has a wonderful presentation uh, documenting how she and her husband restored the land that she uh, that that has been in her family in central Missouri. She has wonderful photos. So I think you'll all enjoy that. You can register online at, at uh, grownative.org or uh, moprairie.org. Uh, and um, certainly is a great evening to curl up with a bird ID book. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very much, Bruce and Vernon. And thank you all for tuning in and joining us uh, today. So thank you all for your support and watch for an email with some of these resources and links and a, and a link to a recording of the program as well. Good night, everyone. Good birding. <laughs>